we go. <clears throat> well, thank you, Malcolm. Um, what I'm talking about tonight is, I think, one of the most important subjects that uh, we need to consider and consider very seriously, not just on a local level, but also on a global level. Um, but it is part of an even bigger picture, <clears throat> which is the issue of the sustainability of human civilization. Now, George Hegel, in the middle of the 19th century, said, freedom is the recognition of necessity. What I think he meant by that was that if you want to send a rocket to the moon, you have to understand a lot about Newtonian physics, about the, the, the motion of the planets, um, how you build uh, fuel, how, how much thrust you get and so on. Unless you observe those things, those, the observation of those things is absolutely necessary, then you're not free to get to the moon. And in a similar way, uh, if we want to grow our food, there are certain th requirements for food which are absolutely necessary. And without those, uh, we will not be able to continue to, to uh, uh, produce the food necessary for a very large and uh, uh, increasing population. Now let's go back to uh, the early 1800s, <clears throat> the global population was approximately a billion people in about 1820. It had grown extremely slowly up to that point. But since 1820, the global population has um, grown by a factor of seven. And at the same time, each of us in the world, on average, has increased our demand on the environment sevenfold. We use seven times as much resources as our great-great-grandparents did in about 1820. One of the observations that comes out of that is that up until about that early period, most of the energy that we used came from our own muscles, supplemented to a certain extent by uh, horse and oxen power and in the case of grinding uh, corn or transport by wind power and water power. All of the energy was renewable. And what happened from then onwards was that we discovered how to use fossil fuel and our use of fossil fuel has expanded enormously over that period of time. First coal, <coughs> then um, petroleum and now we're moving into gas. All of those fuels are non-renewable. They're all running out. But in the meantime, we've built up this very large population which has this voracious appetite, not just for food, but a whole lot of other things as well. Now, one of the things that, that I really want to get across tonight, which is absolutely <coughs> fundamental, that our growth during that period, from, from the <clears throat> early 1800s through to the present time, our growth in population and our growth in per capita consumption of global resources has been exponential. In other words, it's been increasing by a certain percentage per year. It's not the same amount per year, but it's a percentage per year, and that <coughs> growth is, uh, follows an exponential curve. Now, if you want to obtain the time for an exponentially growing quantity to double, you simply divide the percentage by 70, and that gives you the doubling time. Now, this is, this is known to uh, quite a number of you. For instance, <clears throat> our economy is now growing roughly 3%, has been growing for around about 3% for quite a few decades give or take a bit. That means that in 23 years, the economy will double. The demand on the environment will double. The Chinese economy currently is growing around about 7%. Its demand on the global economy will double in 10 years. Quite recently, it was growing at 10%, which meant its demand on the global economy 
was doubling in seven years. Now, one of the most important things to come out of understanding the exponential rate of change is that the amount used in each doubled period is equal to all the, all the usage in all previous history. So if, if the Australian economy doubles in 23 years, in the next 23 years the throughput through the Australian economy will be more than all the, the, uh, the throughput since white settlement. Our black coal reserves are being exploited about 3.2% per year, increasing at, at, at that rate each year. So in roughly 20 years, the next 20 years, there will be more black coal exploited and exported from Australia than in all, the, all previous history. So, for instance, <clears throat> in the first period we have uh, one unit used. In the second one we have two. One plus two equals three, which is less than the next doubling, four. And so on, as we run down the seven is less than eight, and so on, and 63 is less than 64. This is a very important point to grasp about exponential change, that in every doubling, more is used than in all previous history. So <clears throat> we're in a situation in which we are simply growing unsustainably, and that relates very much to our food consumption. Put this graphically, <coughs> um, each new block is larger, is, is double the previous one, but is larger than all the previous, mm. previous blocks. So in every doubling interval, the amount consumed is greater than in all previous consumption. <coughs> so we're really talking about <coughs> this increase in population and the increasing demand and whether that can be food, uh, whether that can be uh, sustained, we want to then turn to, to that in relation to uh, food. Just to put a, a bit of Australian data in here, this was the, uh, the growth uh, in the Australian economy uh, for the last 25 years of the last century, growing at 3.2% per year. And um, the GDP growth per capita was 1.9%, so that you'll see that 60% of our increased demand on the Australian environment was due to uh, um, uh, economic growth, and 40% of that increased demand was due to uh, population growth. <coughs> now, turning specifically to food, we lived as gatherers and hunters for about 99.99% of our evolutionary history. Human beings, like most other animals, are roughly 10% efficient. Which means that if you're gathering or hunting, or as Malcolm mentioned, if you're growing your own vegetables in your backyard and you're eating those and you're not bringing in anything from outside, you have to grow 10 calories or 10 kilojoules for every one that you expend on the, on the task of, of growing the food. If you don't, you starve. And of course, if you only got 10 calories or 10 kilojoules for every one that you expended, uh, you would be living an absolute mere subsistence. It would be literally hand to mouth. We know that most uh, extant gatherer-hunter societies in fact did much, much better than that because they had song and they had dance and they, they uh, decorated themselves and they, they sat around uh, um, fires telling stories and so on. Many of them have been measured to actually uh, collect something like 50 units of energy for every one that they expended uh, in their gathering and hunting. And when you turn 
and look at a modern industrial society, our food production, rather than getting 10 out for every one we put in, on average we're putting 10 in for every one we get out. And if you look at some of our uh, fishing operations, the outputs are, um, are less than one for 200 units of energy going in. And one can think of, for instance, the, um, the tuna fish farming at Port Lincoln, where those fish are taken and then um, <coughs> sent on an aeroplane to Japan and sold on the Japanese uh, fish market. Ext extremely energy inefficient. So how can we do this? How can we sustain this, this sort of um, very energy inefficient form of food production? Because we are substituting fossil fuel for human and renewable energy. And that is the only thing which has allowed us to, uh, to um, sustain at the moment these very large populations with very high levels of consumption. And modern industrial agriculture has frequently been described as the process of using soil to turn oil into food. Something like 80% of our energy uh, comes from, from uh, oil and most of our energy still comes from fossil fuels. In Australia, as in America, about 17 to 18% of all our primary energy goes into some aspect of getting, producing food and getting food from the farm to our plate. And most of that energy is, is uh, in the form of petroleum. If you wondered whether there was a, uh, a link between uh, petroleum and, uh, and um, the uh, price of food, the uh, UN uh, World Food Index price has hit a record high just recently and this has occurred just <coughs> showing the relationship over the last 10 years. Clearly there is a close link between the, um, the cost of oil and the cost of food. And when I'm talking about oil being used in food production, it's not just to drive the tractors. It's, it's to drive the tractors to prepare the land. It's to transport the seeds and the fertilisers to, to the properties. It's to then transport the, to, to harvest the food, transport the food to the packaging places, to process the food, to uh, then transport it again to supermarkets and outlets. And uh, then, of course, you get in your car and you go down, in, in our case, 10 kilometres to buy a litre of milk, uh, using an enormous amount of energy, and then you take it home, and if it's, if it's food that needs cooking, you cook it, and again, you use fossil energy to cook it. So you're using an enormous amount of that fossil energy to, uh, to get the food to your plate. Two quotes from the uh, uh, reputable uh, American authorities on, uh, on oil. Uh, I recognise many people in this room um, are well aware of the, uh, the, uh, the term peak oil and have uh, discussed it a lot. Uh, over the, uh, the last few years, but um, while in general the Americans have been denying that we are at, past or very close to the peak, uh, just recently they seem to have come around to the view that we are indeed at the peak or very close to it, and from here on the availability of oil will go down, the price of oil will go up, and consequently the availability of food and the price of food uh, will be very severely affected. <clears throat> Food and water are the two most essential things for life. What I really want to talk about uh, then here is things like water, um, fossil fuels and their availability, particularly petroleum, and phosphorus, which is another absolutely critical resource and particularly in the Australian context uh, and which is in, in increasing short supply and becoming very expensive. In March uh, 2009 the um, UK Chief um, 
uh, scientist said this, said our food reserves are at a 50 year low, but by 2030, 2030, only, only um, 20 years away, we will need to be producing 50% more food, we will need 50% more energy, 30% more fresh water. They are dramatic problems and they're all intimately connected. You can't think about dealing with one without considering the others. We must deal with all these together. Within a week, Jonathan Porritt, who was the head of the UK uh, Committee on Sustainability, said that uh, uh, John Beddington was being too optimistic. Mm -hmm. um, so what really is happening? I mean, you have that statement that we need to very massively increase our, our food production. What has been happening is that uh, the rate of food uh, production increase has actually been declining. In 1961, it was around about 2.4% per year. It's now down to about 1.2% per year. The Green Revolution is, is running out partly because the requirements for the Green Revolution were things like uh, increased irrigation, and we're running out of water, uh, and increased fertiliser use, and fertiliser uh, use, whether if it's nitrogen fertiliser, it's critically dependent upon the price of petroleum. If it's uh, phosphorus, that is becoming scarce uh, also. Now Egypt has been very much in the, in the news recently and I, I want to show you a couple of slides because I think uh, very little of the discussion about the Egyptian situation uh, so far in the media has really dealt with the underlying uh, factors which are to deal with the, which, are, which deal with the, the imbalance between the size and the, uh, the rate of growth of the Egyptian population and the inability to feed their people. In 1960, Egypt was a net exporter of wheat, even though, as you'll see, only 3% of its land area is arable, and that's all down the, the Nile Valley. In 1960, with a population of 27.8 million, roughly a quarter larger than Australia's present population, Egypt nonetheless was a net exporter of wheat. <clears throat> in 1989, I went there as a member of a parliamentary delegation, and already in 1989, Egypt had become a massive importer of wheat and a lot of other food materials as well population is now four times, or three and a half times that, 81.7 million. Population growth rate, 2% per year. So in 2046, if it <coughs> continues, and one doubts whether it can, uh, it would be 164 million. As I say, only 3% of the land area is arable. That's in the Nile Valley. And where do you think, if you've been to Egypt at all, you know where? where Cairo and, and the other cities are, are spreading. They're spreading their houses and their, and their roads and everything else down along the Nile Valley, covering up that small amount of, of arable land. Arable land per, per capita, 0 0.4 hectares at present. If that population growth rate increases, it of course would be 0 0.02 hectares per capita. But it won't be, there'll be even less land available because they will have covered it all up with houses and, and, and roads. Egypt imports 40% of its food and 60% of its grain. Now Mubarak was actually being able to subsidise both food and fuel in Egypt because Egypt was a net exporter of oil. And he used the profits from oil exports to subsidise uh, the food and fuel used by his people. But oil production peaked in 1997 in Egypt and it's now gone down, it's declined 30% since that time. 
this graph is, is uh, interesting because the, the peak of production is not the peak of the balance between import and export because you can see already by that, that time the consumption of petroleum by the Egyptian population itself left less for export. Anyway, exports and, and imports have been in, in, in balance and by 2006-2007 um, Egypt became a net importer of oil. So there is no longer the money available to subsidise either fuel or the food for the Egyptian people. Half of whom we heard on the program last night, if you watched SBS, live on less than $2 a day. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a situation which I think has significant um, messages for Australia in that while we have uh, reasonable food production at the present time uh, and um, uh, we're not going hungry, nonetheless we are running out of oil very, very quickly. We're shifting to the use of natural gas, but what are we doing? We're not saving that. We're flogging it off and selling it overseas as fast as we can go. <clears throat> when I was on this, um, this trip to the Middle East, I was sitting in the aeroplane flying over Saudi Arabia at a height of about 35,000 feet, and I looked out the window. Mm. I could see these incredibly green circles on an absolutely white sandy plain and I said to somebody what the hell are those things <clears throat> and what they are or what they were because they're almost uh, going to disappear very soon is the the Saudi Arabians were growing wheat at four to five times the the world price dragging out fossil water from way down in the aquifers killing off their their uh, oases and they were, they were uh, growing these, these circles of wheat. Now that was, uh, I saw the early ones of these in 1989. Wheat production in Saudi Arabia is almost finished because the fossil water has run out. And by, uh, the Saudi Arabian government has said that by 2016, there will be no wheat production in Saudi Arabia at all. In the meantime, the Saudi Arabian population is increasing very, very rapidly. So this is the sort of massive irrigators turning in those big, big circles which were allowing them to grow wheat just for a couple of decades, using up water that had been there for you know, perhaps tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years. <coughs> if we turn to uh, phosphorus, <coughs> as you all know phosphorus for a long time was uh, mined on uh, Pacific and other islands from the guano which um, were bird droppings which contained large amounts of phosphorus and that was uh, processed and um, exported around the world and, and used to, um, to fertilize soils. Now Australian soils are extremely low in phosphorus roughly a quarter of the phosphorus content compared with the average American soil. So in Western Australia, for example, there would be no wheat production at all if it were not for the addition of phosphorus, because the phosphorus content is so low. The guano is virtually gone, so we're now left with mining rock phosphate. There are two main deposits of rock phosphate in the world. There are deposits in China and there are deposits in Algeria. The Chinese, about two years ago, very significantly increased the price of their uh, phosphorus exports, recognising they needed it for themselves. Uh, and the amount of phosphorus available in those deposits is in quite rapid decline. And this is one way of presenting what one thinks might be the ultimate recoverable amount of phosphorus. And <clears throat> this graph indicates that again, phosphorus is in very rapid decline. Now if we come, come to Australia, <clears throat> a lot of people say, 
Australia's a big country, you know, we can, we can have millions and millions of people here. Look, we've got all this space and so on. But it's not space that is so necessary for humans. It's food and it's water and it's other, it's minerals and a whole range of other resources. Only 6% of Australia's land is arable. So if we really put Australia <laughs> on the map, and 6% of the area, it's round about the size of Borneo. And that's the, the area that we're really looking at for the production of food. Nonetheless, compared with other countries in the world, in terms of just sheer, the amount, the sheer uh, amount of arable land, Australia looks pretty good. We have more arable land per capita than anybody else. However, note, here is France. France produces more wheat than Australia does. The French soil uh, and availability of um, uh, growing, uh, to, to grow wheat is much, much greater than in Australia. Australia has very, very ancient leached soils compared with, say, North America, which were, uh, during the last ice age, were under extensive uh, uh, glaciation and they had very, very deep and very, very rich soils. I think uh, Ohio, for instance, started off with something like 16 feet of topsoil, whereas, you know, most Australian soils have, have just, you know, a few centimetres of topsoil, which um, is very rapidly uh, lost if we're not careful with it. Australia also has a very variable uh, rainfall and uh, you can see there that um, it, uh, it does vary quite a bit. If you look at Western Australia, and I mentioned uh, earlier that um, uh, Western Australia without phosphorus addition would not be able to grow wheat at all. Um, there's only a very, very small part of Western Australia that is capable of growing, growing wheat. When you look at what's happening, possibly because of climate change, to the rainfall in the Perth area, and this, this is the uh, intake into uh, Perth's reservoirs. And you'll see that um, uh, in 1974, Perth suffered a sudden decline in rainfall, result, resulting in a 50% uh, fall in stored water supply. Now, the amount of water that's available is not only due to the amount of rain that you get, it's also due to the temperature and the amount of evap evaporation and so on, and the condition of the soil, whether you can actually collect that water. So that relatively small uh, decreases in rainfall can actually give you a very substantial decrease in the amount of runoff and the availability of water for growing crops. So there was this substantial decline and it now appears as though there might have been a further 20% decline uh, in the uh, runoff in Perth. And this is a, a general phenomenon across that southwest corner of Western Australia. There's much reduced rainfall. <coughs> as a consequence, the, um, look, just look at this uh, top curve for a moment. Australian wheat production is highly variable. You'll see that in 2002, the production of wheat was something like only 40% of what it was in 2003. Now, if our population were to double on, on those sorts of figures, it would mean that in a bad year we would not have enough wheat to feed the Australian public. And there would probably be nowhere else in the world where we, from where we could uh, import wheat. Our yields of wheat are poor by comparison with other countries. Uh, you'll see that uh, the Australian uh, production has varied between 0.7 and 1.5 uh, tonnes per hectare compared with the UK at about 2.8 um, tonnes per hectare. Interestingly, if you look at these curves here, they're the Tasmanian wheat production. So if, given the right conditions, the right rainfall and, and soil and so on, uh, 
we can grow wheat at quite a high, uh, high level, but for the other states, the actual wheat production is really quite poor. So even though we have uh, an apparently quite large area of arable land per head, um, the ability of that land to produce is very much constrained uh, by both water and, uh, and uh, uh, fertility. Turning to South Australia, we again have this very, very small sliver of, uh, of land here and then down in the southeast, a little bit down in that <coughs> corner with a reasonably reliable rainfall for uh, production of, of food. So, <coughs> can we feed Australia? Before I came out tonight, I heard um, our uh, Prime Minister addressing the New Zealand Parliament saying that uh, she would allow the importation of New Zealand apples into Australia. You see that um, round about um, here, our fruit imports exceeded our fruit exports. And several years earlier, our vegetable uh, imports exceeded our vegetable exports. So in these areas already, uh, it would seem that uh, we're having some difficulty. Relevant to that and relevant to uh, what has been going on in this area, uh, I'll just tell you a little story. Um, I graduated in medicine in 1956. In 1957, I did a locum down at Lockleys for six months. The lower part of the uh, Torrens Valley through Lockleys was all market garden. Mainly Italians, and I remember because one did a lot of home visits in those days, you'd go to an Italian home, the, 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 the husband would work over at Holden's, he'd then want a certificate for a day off when the cabbages were ripe or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> um, you would always come away with cabbages or carrots or tomatoes or whatever, depending in season, because that was rich alluvial soil along that valley. It's all covered up with houses. Years later, I was living at Ross Trevor. In 1973 and 1974, I was actually on the Campbelltown Council, and we fought bitterly to protect the market garden areas at Campbelltown, 600 acres of rich alluvial soil on that part of the Torrens. We lost in council by one vote. And that area has all gone under housing. It's bloody awful soil for building on. I mean, it cracks like anything. People will tell you how the celery grows up through the foundations, but they're all falling apart. It's terrible building soil, and yet it's marvellous soil for growing things. And now we have the situation of Mount Barker, just recently, where seems developers went to the government said you know we want this land for for housing development the government rolled over and said yes you can have it and another 1300 hectares of good quality arable land will simply go under houses um, and we lost to food production So Michael Ladelli, who's a colleague of um, some of us in this room uh, from the University of Adelaide, has summarised this situation, saying that within 10 years Australian food production will almost certainly be lower than today. Within 40 years, by 2050, most oil will be gone, uh, and we will need to have completed a revolution in nutrient recycling. And what he's referring to there is the fact that at the moment, we take this phosphorus from deposits in, in, uh, in Algeria or China, or uh, there are small deposits in Australia, one a Duchess in Queensland, another one in the Northern Territory, which incidentally, if you read the newspapers, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll know that the government is very keen to see this all exported offshore <laughs> to earn more dollars. Um, there are some small deposits here. But what we do is we take all that uh, phosphorus, we grow our food, we send it in, into the cities, because most of us live in cities. And what do we do? We send it down the sewer and we, we send it out into the ocean. Mm. Most of it. 
So what he's referring to here in nutrient recycling is that we will need to rechange our uh, change our whole system of handling nutrients, particularly phosphorus, to get, to get that back onto the land. And we will have to have completed that revolution in nutrient recycling and relocalization of agriculture for even our current population to survive. And what he means by the relocalization is he's raising a big question mark over this idea of whether cities are sustainable at all when you have to drag all the resources into the into the city and all the all the waste has to be got out which is a very energy intensive process and what the future might well be is far more local communities such as this one here living reasonably self sufficiently uh, within within their their local community uh, just a so I started off with, the, uh, with, with Hegel's aphorism, freedom is the recognition of necessity. And I'll conclude with this one from uh, J.K. Galbraith, the American uh, economist. Nothing changes conventional wisdom except the relentless march of circumstance. <clears throat> we know the circumstances, the circumstances are dire. Our politicians, by and large, are not listening. Most of them, only two or three years ago, had never even heard of peak oil, and yet, you know, that, those who are concerned about it have been talking about it for the last 30 years. Conventional wisdom is that we can have business as usual, we can go on growing our population, whether it's by uh, natural increase, baby, baby bonuses and so on, or by, by uh, uh, immigration, and we can go on growing the economy. 3% per year would be terrific, you know, we can push those resources through, we need people to consume more, you know, we've got to have, them, got to have the economy growing. Uh, so we've now got people who've got to consume so other people can produce so that we can have this, this thing called the economy growing. The circumstances are very different but our politicians are not listening. It will be a, a great sadness if we have to wait for the relentless march of circumstance to get through to our politicians to change the situation. So, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.